The two gentlemen who spoke prior to me have been uh, absolutely perfect lead-ins. While I was messing with slides, I was talking with a fellow uh, aviator about, uh, about a little bit of flying stories, and we uh, were talking about different aircraft we'd flown. Pilots think of themselves as wonderful people and spontaneous and just wild and crazy, and they're exactly the opposite of that. The last thing you want is a creative pilot. <laughs> creative pilots don't live very long. Old pilots know exactly what's going to happen every second. They know how much fuel it takes to taxi, how much it takes to climb out, exactly how long it's going to take to get to their destination, exactly what they're going to do when they get there. And if they can't get there, they know where they're going to go. If they can't get to the first place, they know the second place they're going to get to. If anything goes wrong, they have checklists and procedures that they follow down to the nth degree. And consequently, you can get on an airliner with a 9999999% chance of getting to your destination routinely Maybe late, but you'll get there in one piece. There's no reason why logistics can't be the same way. But before I get into that too much, I work for a fellow named Jack Holly. He's a retired Marine Colonel. He's, uh, he's been around for uh, in Iraq. He was the first CPA employee, and he's still there. So in fact, he is by far the longest serving person in our Iraq effort. He's been director of logistics since Admiral Nash hired him on the first day. Um, Jack. In keeping with the acronym procedure, we've had two acronyms, has an acronym that he likes to use, but you have to work it out for yourself. It describes the logistics process, the parts that go into logistics, shipping, handling, insurance, transportation, and security. If you remember that simple acronym, you'll know all the parts to, to logistics for the rest of your lives. Jack also has a motto that goes very well with what, uh, what Chuck just talked about, and that is, we do windows. Jack is probably the most loyal boss and friend I've ever worked for. Jack will fire you in an eye blank if you say, that's not my job. Because in our world, in the logistics world, there is no such thing as it's not our job. It's our job to make sure that the mission gets done and the logistics gets accomplished. I'm going to speak mostly in terms of Iraq, but I'm going to add some things about how what we're doing in Iraq build into <clears throat> what we would uh, what need to do in any disaster, post-disaster, uh, post-conflict situation. Next slide, please. Okay, what was going to happen? What was supposed to happen when we went into Iraq? There would be rose petals strewn <laughs> before us, and we would just, it would be like operating in, in Washington State or, or someplace, or Arizona. Well, there are some assumptions that were made, and that didn't happen. Next slide, please. When Jack got to Iraq, <clears throat> he had no budget, no facilities, and no staff. <clears throat> but what he did have was a little bit of mobility. So he was able to apply the principles that we've been talking about, the planning principles of what you've got to do to establish a logistics operation. You need warehouses. You need access to an airport. You need access to a port. Now, the initial assumption was, in those initial assumptions, we were going to support the reconstruction of Iraq. But it was only going to be the non-construction items. Anybody needed parts for a power plant, it was up to them to bring that power plant in and every little bit of that power plant, and it was FOB destination. But there are a lot of things that go with that, because you bought a hospital, but how about the stuff that goes in the hospital? Well, the stuff that goes in the hospital, the hospital beds, the surgical tables, the x-ray machines, all that, was purchased on separate contracts. So fire trucks for the firehouses and things like that. So that was going to be our mission. Well. Didn't quite work out that way. Because you see, a lot of agencies had the ability to let contracts. There was no central agency in charge. And everybody had the ability to let contracts. So things would show up at the airport, like plane loads of Soviet block ammunition with no bill of lading, no destination, and it'd be dumped on the side of the airport runway. Jack, by putting together his logistics system, and with some help from uh, some wonderful uh, contractor friends of ours, managed to uh, keep things under control. And I'll get into a little bit more about how that actually worked as we go along. Next slide. Please. OK, what was supposed to happen was what was in the initial assumptions. This slide was made up by uh, Brigadier General Anderson about two weeks ago from the J-4 over there. And it shows what actually happened to PCO logistics as opposed to what was supposed to happen. All those purple boxes are things that were outside of what we were originally scheduled to do. But because Jack's motto is, we do do windows, 
we've been able to successfully handle that and continue to expand out our operations with the help of a whole lot of people in this room. As a matter of fact, it would have been physically impossible without the help of people in this room for the simple reason that this entire operation is run by between 9 and 12 government people. Of those 9 and 12 government people, the military rotate in and out, has been as short as four months, has been as long as a year. We have uh, three civilians and the rest are, rest are military. Most are reservists pop in for six months or so. We've gone through over 200. The only two people who have been with the program for the entire time are Jack and I. What we do, the very first thing when you check in is you go to a contracting officer's representative course because everyone is a core. If you can't pass that course, you can't keep your job. So we start off with everybody coming in at a, at a, uh, a level where they're pretty much equal. Next slide, please. What do we do? Well, this is as of 16 September. On 17 September, we've uh, monitored uh, 15,000 convoys. We've delivered almost 500,000 weapons. Uh, somewhere around 500 million rounds of ammunition, uh, almost 800 k's worth of uniforms. And in that time frame, we've lost nothing, zero, zip, zilch. We've been audited by every IG that uh, exists and successfully passed them. This all came to pass. Next slide, please. Uh, before I go on, they talk about freedom's not free. This is, uh, this is what's happened to our people, and these are all civilians. Those are, none of those are U.S. or coalition soldiers. Uh, some of them are, uh, a few of them are Americans, most of them are uh, nationals. We actually have uh, five MIAs. Five? I'm sorry, reconstruction MIA. Our own, we've been very lucky. This, by the way, total only counts the convoys we monitor. It doesn't count any other convoys, being military convoys or unregistered convoys. Next slide. The contracts have changed a little bit, but the areas haven't. We've just been in the process of letting new, new, uh, new uh, contracts. We have. Two major warehouse complexes, one at uh, Umm Qasar in the North Port, and another one at Abu Ghraib, not the prison. It's like saying Fairfax County, Abu Ghraib is a really big area. At the one at, uh, at uh, Abu Ghraib is uh, 41 buildings. It's uh, spread over a very large area. Uh, Jack discovered a T-55 tank maintenance base that already had blast walls around it. And so we, uh, he cleverly got a lease in there that the cost of the lease is whatever improvements we make are turned over to the Iraqis when we're gone. Same thing for the uh, Port of Umm Qasar, so it costs us nothing. Although at Umm Qasar, they have billed us four times for $24 million storage on things that we're giving them. <laughs> we haven't paid that bill, I might, uh, I might add. We also have a facility at the airport. All goods, Jack designing the system, designed it so that all high-value goods, night vision goggles, weapons, ammunition, are flown into the airport where they're picked up by our friends from Skylink under, uh, under Agility's uh, direction Thank right now yeah. and uh, transferred to our base out at uh, Abu Ghraib. You would think that would be easy because they're practically touching Camp Victory except that they don't actually touch and you have to go outside the wire to uh, get up to uh, Abu Ghraib. And if you're uh, ever messing around with Google Earth, just go north of the airport a little bit. You'll see a four-lane highway. Follow it out to the east, and you'll see a burning truck. That's one of ours. Uh, the Google sat the satellite just happened to snap the photo right after, uh, right after we got hit. Jack got these leases, and they're good until, until we turn them over to the Iraqis. Now, Jack also knew from the beginning that we weren't going to be there forever. So the entire system is designed to be turnkey to the Iraqis. We built a logistics movement control center at Villa 2 in the uh, international zone. In the logistics movement control center, we have a complete system for tracking all the convoys. All the convoys that were registered with us have a transponder that transmits a signal so we can follow them continuously. If there's a problem, they've got a panic button. They hit the panic button. We immediately put them in touch with the uh, US military forces for quick reaction force. <coughs> the system works very well. <coughs> 